Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our Zoom room. Um, I hope you have a bagel in hand or at least a cup of coffee for our first ever virtual Sunday brunch. Um, I'm Dale Rosengarten, curator of the Jewish Heritage Collection at the College of Charleston's Adelstone Library and director of the Pralstein Lipov Center for Southern Jewish Culture. My co-hosts today are Ashley Walters. Ashley, wave your hand. And hiding behind the um, college insignia is Kim Browdy. Uh, Ashley is assistant professor of Jewish studies at the college, and Kim is associate director for community relations. A hearty thank you from the Center for Southern Jewish Culture to our co-sponsors, the Jewish Historical Society of South Carolina. Hello, Lily and Rachel, I know you're both there. And also the Bremen Jewish Heritage Museum in Atlanta. Um, I'll introduce our guest of honor, David E. Lowe, in just a minute. But first, a few housekeeping notes. Um, our plan is for Ashley and me to talk to David for about 15 or 20 minutes, then begin to take questions from the chat box. Please type your questions there, and we'll ask as many of them as we can in an hour. At 11 o'clock, we'll end the formal session, but keep the Zoom room open for up to 30 minutes for anyone who wants to stay and continue the conversation. We will be recording, we are recording the session, and to make it available, and we'll make it available online afterwards. So to avoid any unintended audio, we're keeping everybody muted. If you want to unmute uh, and say, say something, you can raise your hand. Um, I, I, I hope you all know how to use the chat function and the hand raising functions uh, at the bottom of the screen. Now, let me tell you briefly about the author of the prize winning and truly marvelous book we'll be discussing this morning, David E. Lowe. And David, wave your hand so everybody who doesn't know you will know you. Uh, is a retired vice president for government relations and public affairs for the National Endowment for Democracy. He holds a PhD in political science from Johns Hopkins University and has taught at New University, George Washington University's Graduate School of Political Management and the, Was and the Washington Sem Semester Program of Lewis and Clark College. He has consulted for the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum and UN Watch, about which I expect we will hear more later. Touched with fire, Morris B. Abram and the Battle Against Racial and Religious Di Discrimination is Dr. Lowe's first book and surely not his last. So to begin, let me ask you, David, um, how did you come to write this book? Uh, thank you, Dale, and thank you, Ashley Walters, for organizing this program. Uh, and thanks to all of our sponsors. It's really a pleasure to be with you this morning. Um, it had a very interesting origin. You mentioned the National Endowment for Democracy. I retired in early 2016 and spent the next year consulting for a number of nonprofit organizations, including UN Watch. And I hope a lot of you have heard of UN Watch. It's an organization based in Geneva, Switzerland. Morris Abram was its founding chairman. It monitors the United Nations. And I should add that if, if there's any organization in, the, in this world that needs monitoring, it's the United Nations. Um, I got a call in early 2017 from Hillel Neuer. I'd been doing some consulting for you and watch as, get, as uh, Dale mentioned. And he asked if I would write a, put together actually a slideshow uh, about its founding chairman for the um, organization's website. And um, I said I would. And uh, I went down to Emory University where Morris Abrams papers are archived. And um, one thing that Hilla did not know when he called me was that there are some very interesting parallels in my life and in the life of Morris Abram. For one thing, we're both from the state of Georgia. He's from Fitzgerald, which is a small town in South Central Georgia, and I come from Savannah, which is about 200 miles to the east. Um, he, he, uh, uh, we both were once associated with Brandeis University. He, as the incoming second president in the fall of 1968, and me as an incoming freshman in the fall 
of 1968. And also he uh, ascended to the leadership of the organized American Jewish community, first as the president of the American Jewish Committee in the early 1960s, early to mid 1960s. And later, uh, as we'll talk about uh, with, uh, he became actually chairman of the President's Conference. And uh, I joined ADL in the fall of 1982. And shortly thereafter, Mars Abram became the chairman of the National Conference on Soviet Jewry. So there were a number of parallels. And when I started looking through his, his papers, it occurred to me that um, his life really deserved much fuller treatment than a slideshow on a website. <laughs> and uh, I'd never written, as you mentioned, Dale, I'd never written a book before, um, but I thought if anybody could at least take a stab at it, it probably should be me. <clears throat> and so I undertook this project. I think there's, there's no way of saying that this is not a remarkable story. Uh, here's a guy who, he grew up in a, uh, in, at the height of Jim Crow segregation in the 30s, 20s, 30s, 40s. And he became one of the leading civil rights lawyers in the South and indeed in the country. He, he, he spent his childhood in a community that had 12 Jewish families. He never had a bar mitzvah service. And yet he ends up, as I said, as the leading spokesman for the American Jewish community. And finally, he, um, when he, when he uh, lived in Atlanta, he started practicing law in Atlanta in the late 1940s. He began a campaign from a small law firm, I should mention, one of whose partners is with us today, Bob Hicks. Very pleased to have Bob with us. And he led a, almost a one-man campaign against um, a system in the state of Georgia that entrenched racial segregation, talking about the county unit system. And in fighting the Georgia political establishment, he also managed to um, become uh, lead to, to argue the case before the Supreme Court, which led to the one man, one person, actually one person, one vote ruling, the first time that had ever been articulated by the Supreme Court. So it's a remarkable story. I thought it required a biography. I thought I'd take a stab at it. And so here we are. Sounds like the, the forces met at the right moment. Um, can you tell us a little more about your research and writing process? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, Morris Abrams' papers are voluminous. Um, I was very fortunate, very fortunate, uh, that I, I consulted, actually, I remember <laughs> consulting with um, someone whose name would be known to a lot of people here, Elliot Abrams um, in, in Washington. He was on the board of NED, and I've known Elliot for years, and I said, Elliot, what do you think about a book about Morris Abram? He said, he gave me two pieces of advice. He said, one, great idea, two, you better hurry. Um, and I did hurry. I think uh, that afternoon I had my first interview. And I was able to track down people who knew Morris Abram from the 1950s. Um, and uh, I was just very lucky in that sense. So I had uh, his papers. I had his uh, people who knew him. And then I had all kind of interesting archives from Brandeis, from the NCSJ uh, archives. And so there was a very rich uh, paper trail about Morris Abram. And uh, lots of people who were, who were willing to talk to me about him, um, most of whom admired him, some of who did not. Um, and um, so I, I, I think it was, I just, you know, just followed that and um, I guess I got very lucky. Just staying for a minute with the process, um, what would you say were your biggest challenges and um, I'll say the moments of epiphany when you realized something surprising about your subject or something surprising about yourself? Well, uh, Surprising about the subject, um, I, I did mention in response to your previous question, he did write an autobiography. Mm -hmm. And the reason he, um, he wrote an autobiography, and, 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 and I must say, the, probably the richest source that I had that I didn't mention was 
uh, a result of an illness that he had in the early 1970s. Morris Abram contracted a very serious form of leukemia uh, right around the time of his 55th birthday. And the American Jewish Committee, uh, well, he, many people thought he would not survive it, including some of his medical team, which was probably the biggest surprise that I encountered in the book. Um, I did, just didn't, I had known about it from his autobiography. But uh, there began um, a, an oral history that was conducted by the great Eli Evans, and I'm sure most people in this audience will know, who, will know that name. Eli Evans did a series of interviews that he taped over a period of about two years during the early, during the time of Morris Abrams' illness, the height of his illness, which was very, very rich and which I was able to gain access to at the New York Public Library. There is copy also in his papers, buried in his papers actually. Um, and uh, so that was a big surprise to me. Now, he did a series of interviews with a former Brandeis student named Pranay Gupti, a very well-known journalist, international journalist. He allowed his story to be told on the front page of the New York Times about his, about his illness. And so folks who were regular readers of the New York Times did know about his illness. Um, but like I said, I did not realize how close a call it was for him. And uh, he did survive, and he managed to live for um, all of the major accomplishments, except for the AJC, that he did in the 1980s. And then in the 1990s, with UN Watch, came after he was declared um, mostly cancer-free in the late 1970s. Mm -hmm. And did you learn anything surprising about yourself? Uh, well, uh, I'd never thought I could write a book. Um, and I have this theory that everybody has at least one book in them, which is why I want to write a second book to prove that I can write a second book. So I've actually started another project. Um, we can act, we can talk about that. If people are interested, they can ask about that too. So I, I'd like to go back. Uh, to the beginning. I'm, I'm a historian. I always like to start at the beginning uh, with Abram's boyhood in this remarkable town of Fitzgerald. Um, frankly, I didn't know anything about Fitzgerald, Georgia until I read your book and was astonished to find that there was a town set up uh, explicitly to create a reconciliation between Confederate and Union ex-soldiers uh, to, the, to the extent of naming streets uh, deliberately in the town, some for Confederate generals, some for Union right. generals. Right. Uh, they wound right. up having a museum, a blue-gray museum, uh, a battalion of blue and gray that marched on the streets. Um, how, how do you think Abram's upbringing in this small Georgia town influenced his career choices and his style of diplomacy? Well, he always said it influenced him profoundly. Um, it's very, very, it's a very interesting story. And he was very proud of his, um, even though he had a lot of ambivalence about it, it was still very much a segregationist uh, community at that time. Um, his parents were married, by the way, in the, I think they were the first to, to get married in the Lee Grant Hotel. And if you go to Fitzgerald, I did go to visit Fitzgerald. Um, it's a terrific place, still very small. Um, it, uh, it, it was unique in, in, in U.S. history. Uh, there was a big drought after the Civil War that affected uh, lots of people in the Midwest. And there was a cry for help that came from a, uh, an Indianapolis, uh, Indiana news editor named uh, Fitzgerald, who had been a captain in the Civil War. And uh, Governor Northern, uh, interesting <laughs> coincidence, Governor Northern in Georgia uh, answered the call and he sent supplies and the two of them got together and they planned this community, uh, which got started in the late part of the uh, 19th century. And it began slowly getting populated by Jewish Jews. As we know, these stories, 
that, that are just remarkable that keep surfacing in the South about the early Jews in the community. Um, there was a dry goods store. Morris Abram's father immigrated from Romania. That's a really interesting story after the famous uh, pogrom in Kishniev. And uh, he was the third Jewish uh, resident of, of Fitzgerald. He worked for his uncle. Morris Abram remembered his uncle. And Sam Abram married a woman named Irene Abram, who was the Irene um, Cohen, who was the great, who was the granddaughter of one of the first reform rabbis in the United States. And since our time is limited, I mean, I could talk forever about this, but it's a, it's a terrific story. Uh, I mentioned that there were only 12 Jewish families in Fitzgerald. What I didn't mention was that um, all but the Abram family, um, well, most of those 12 were, were from Eastern European ancestry mm -hmm. descent. And um, Irene Abram, who's was the granddaughter of Rabbi Epstein, uh, was German. And um, for, for various reasons, she did not want to have much to do with the other Jews in town. And so Morris Abram and the Abram family, although they occasionally would travel to Albany, which was about 80 miles to the, to the west, um, for services, they um, never really spent any time associating with the other Jews in town. And so Morris Abram said half jokingly to Eli Evans in the oral history interview that he was raised as a Protestant, except for one thing. He had a neighbor who was actually of Dutch Jewish origin, who had um, become the editor of the alternative paper. He was a bit of a radical in town. And he exposed Morris Abram to texts about Jewish culture and Jewish history. And at the age of 13, an age which other Jewish boys then would have their bar mitzvah service, Morris Abram was giving speeches at bar mitzvahs services. And he started his career as a, as a public speaker. He gave his first public, uh, 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 public speech outside of Fitzgerald in my hometown of Savannah. Um, where he defended the railroads. Fitzgerald was a, it was a railroad terminal. He defended the railroads and he, defend, and he, he, he spoke out for the railroads and for the workers. Um, and so anyway, it, it's a fascinating story. And um, yes, it definitely helped shape his, his future in many ways. Now, um, it was segregationist. And um, yet uh, there was never a lynching there. It did have some um, sort of traces of, of enlightened views about race. Andrew Young, who I was able to interview, um, said that he was from a similar town in Louisiana, which mm -hmm. was the home of Huey Long. So there were these places in various parts of the South that had little, little traces of you know, uh, opposition to the, the most awful forms of Jim Crow. Um, but he also said, Morris Abram, that he, uh, that the greatest form of drama and entertainment in, in Southern communities was um, provided by the courthouse. And that's where local politics really got their, their formation. And um, he became very, very interested in politics at an early age. And so we, we can talk a little bit more about that. That's, that's a wonderful answer. I have to admit, it's one of my favorite parts of the book, reading about this from very unusual town, um, Fitzgerald. Um, at, at this point, Ashley, I wanted to ask you to uh, pitch a few questions. We promised we would leave plenty of time for Q&A, but, but the two of us, Ashley and I, have plenty to ask. So why don't you ask a couple of questions, and um, uh, I might ask a couple more, and then we'll open it up. Yeah, so thank you so much. I really enjoyed this book. Um, I read it with intense interest. I think it's a wonderful addition to the historiography and I'm also really excited to have it to use in my classes. So thank you for this. Um, so I wanted to bring us up to the point at which 
Um, Morris goes to Europe, he's on this Rhodes Scholarship, he goes to Oxford, and he has this opportunity to work um, as a research assistant for the head of a team um, of Nuremberg prosecutors. And so I'd like to hear a little bit more about how this experience shaped his worldview. It sounds like this was a very pivotal moment for him, but I'd also really like for you to take us a step further and perhaps talk about his return to Georgia and this decision to take on the county court system. Right, uh, terrific question. Uh, I'd like to go back a little bit um, as, uh, as he um, prepared for his Rhodes uh, interview. He, um, he was very, very ambitious, as you know, and um, in his junior year of college at the University of Georgia, he decided he would apply for a Rhodes Scholarship. And he got to the almost the final cut, and uh, he, didn't, he didn't succeed. And he was complaining about it to his college roommate, Bobby Troutman, um, another interesting name. <laughs> whose uh, father was the uh, general counsel of Coca-Cola, the name Troutman, I'm sure is familiar to a lot of the folks here from Atlanta. And Troutman said, Morris, if you wanna succeed next year, you have to stop talking like a hick. And so uh, as with other things in his life, he became very determined to succeed and he worked that out somehow and he got selected uh, to be a Rhodes Scholar. And yet, um, September 1939 rolls around when he's scheduled to leave for, his, for Oxford. And of course, the program had to be canceled, postponed, uh, because of the outbreak of World War II. So he finishes law school, the University of Chicago. He, um, he uh, uh, volunteers for service in the military. Uh, he was stationed in various places in the in the country. He earned the Legion, Legion of, of Merit um, for work he did out in California for the for the Air Force. And um, he says, I'm going to go to Oxford. I want to go to Oxford. He was married by then. He had a two year old daughter, Ruth Abram. And so he goes to Oxford and he comes under the tutelage of uh, professor Goodhart, who is the professor of jurisprudence, American born. And Professor Goodhart um, had a relationship with Justice Jackson. Now, Justice uh, Robert Jackson was the chief U.S. prosecutor at Nuremberg. And in the summer of 1946, uh, Goodhart asked Jackson if he would take his leading student, Morris Abram, and uh, Jackson agreed. So Morris Abrams spent the summer of 1946 as a research assistant uh, to the tribunal, which was prosecuting Nuremberg war trials. And um, he, his, his assignment was to uh, look at the industrialists and their, their involvement in the war. And the experience changed, it changed his, was life changing for him. Um, he came face to face with the embodiment of evil, um, probably for the first time. And uh, it, it, really, um, it really brought him closer to his Jewish identity. Now, when Mars Abram left for the University of Georgia in uh, 1933, 34, 34, um, he was an anti-Zionist, uh, as, uh, as, as many were, many uh, were during that period of time. He did not want to join a Jewish fraternity. He thought that was too um, segregated and it, it violated uh, certain ideas that he had about, um, about that. And yet at Nuremberg, um, he, he felt like he felt a, a kinship with with uh, with his Jewish identity as he had never felt before, and I did pick out something that I thought, in his words, would would resonate with people here. When Abram left Fitzgerald, Georgia, for the University of Georgia at the age of sixteen, he 
entertained thoughts of becoming a rabbi. And that's something I hadn't mentioned, but that's true. Despite his lack of the most rudimentary Jewish education. And though he was quickly disabused of the idea, the experience a little over a decade later of spending a summer during his Rhodes Scholarship working with the American prosecuting team on the Nuremberg trials had marked a major turning point in his life. I would never be the same after Nuremberg, he wrote, for I now understood that the veneer of civilization is thin and that when it cracks, even in the 20th century, the Jew is the first victim. As his involvement in the Jewish community grew, he recalled, <clears throat> I found the essence of what it meant to me to be Jewish. That essence lies in the collective unconscious of the people from whom I spring, the linkage of ourselves one to another, the ties that we all feel to a greater or lesser extent to Zion, and the determination to survive as Jews, free men and women, wherever we may live. Now, it's interesting, when he went back to, when he, you asked me actually about Atlanta, he, so he goes back to Atlanta in 1948 um, or nine, 1948, to practice law. And he needs to, to supplement his meager income at the time. And so he starts teaching Sunday school. And he develops a relationship with both the American Jewish Committee and um, the Anti-Defamation League. And um, that set him on a, uh, on a, on a route to um, becoming a, um, a, a full-fledged uh, member of the Jewish community in Atlanta. And did it have an impact on his on his uh, views, his progressive views, of course, I think it did. Um, and then he became very, very active in, um, in working with the black community against the tide. Um, he was uh, denied entry into some of the more prestigious social clubs in Atlanta, even though he had developed a firm reputation in the community. And so, yes, um, Nuremberg really did change his life in many profound ways and set him on a course that um, led to so many uh, great achievements in his life. Yeah. And um, I'd love to push you a little further and ask more about, um, because it seems like when he's in Nuremberg or when he's at Oxford, it's when he really begins to think about this county court system. And so I'm wondering if there's this particular moment when he's in Europe, if he's drawing connections between the persecution that Jews had just um, endured under Hitler and what he had seen growing up in the South, or if there's another way that he came to the realization that this county court system would be his mark upon injustice in the US? Very good question. Um, by the way, it was the county unit system. It was oh, the county unit, sorry, county unit system. And I should say a word about the county, the county unit system was a kind of a, a statewide electoral college, um, uh, which was designed to entrench rural interests at the expense of urban interests. Uh, mainly for the purpose of um, excluding blacks uh, who could be intimidated from voting in rural areas and in urban areas, uh, their votes really didn't count. It, it, it basically it disenfranchised not just blacks, but uh, those living in, in, in urban areas um, um, whose votes were diminished drastically by the system. Was that connected to Nuremberg? Um, I'm not sure. He, uh, he went back to Atlanta in, um, and got, got approached by, it's, a, it's an interesting story. He got approached by um, a woman who had been a progressive uh, member of the Georgia legislature who got elected to Congress in a special election that did not include, a county unit system only applied to primary elections because the powers that be knew the primary elections in Georgia were the real thing. They were the ultimate decider because there was hardly any Republican party. So that's how Herman Talmadge was able to win the governorship in 1946 without winning the popular vote. Um, he famously said he did never wanted to carry a county that had a streetcar. Um, and he was approached by a woman who had won the special election, but had been defeated because um, 
in the primary she lost in the that that followed the special election she had been defeated um, by the unit system and um, the way he got involved was that um, he knew the woman's nephew he had been a student at the University of Georgia with him um, so drawing a connection between Nuremberg and the county unit system would be a bit of a stretch, but I think it did impress upon him uh, many um, aspects of human rights. And so he became, uh, during his period in Atlanta, involved with uh, human rights at the United Nations. And um, he became involved in many, many causes that were, were not popular at the time that involved, let's say, the Urban League, that involved housing in Atlanta, things of that sort. That's so interesting. Um, Dale, do you want to ask a final question before we turn it over to the audience? Uh, yeah, <clears throat> I, I wanted to um, jump ahead in Abram's career, but not too far, uh, to a period which I was um, personally, I'll say, interested in uh, his um, uh, accession to the throne at Brandeis as its second president. This was another really kind of remarkable leap for um, Morris Abram. Um, it was at a moment, 1968, when um, the university was in turmoil, as many universities were across the country. Um, David, you were a freshman, so you were an eyewitness to this. Uh, what was going on that fall when you and he arrived? And how did the black student takeover of Ford Hall affect Abram's psyche and his politics? Wow. Um, for one thing, he said it toughened him for his battle against leukemia later on in his, <laughs> which emerged about a few years later. Um, it's, it's an interesting story. Um, where do I start? Well, Morris Abram uh, established himself in New York. In 1962, he left Atlanta and he became very active in the Democratic Party in, in New York, got involved in state, in, in state and city politics. And in 1967, he was encouraged by Bobby Kennedy to run against uh, Senator Javits in, in New York. And um, he was thinking seriously about it, but had to drop out of the race when uh, he realized that his opposition to the war in Vietnam would dry up his funding from the, from the well, from it dry up his endorsement from the White House. And um, that was what uh, led him to drop out of the race. But right around the same time, he received word that he would be uh, he, would, he was um, offered the position of uh, President Brandeis. Now, this was uh, very momentous because Brandeis, which was established in 1948, had had only one president up until that time, and that president was the, was the founder of Brandeis, a Abe Sacker, who um, was the, uh, the, found the founding father of Brandeis. He single-handedly uh, brought the university up to um, a very significant level uh, in higher education very quickly. And he was very, very highly regarded around the country. Uh, Brandeis, remember, is the only uh, non-sectarian Jewish-sponsored university in the United States and was ve well known in the Jewish community. And that was not well known where I grew up in Savannah. Um, Probably not well known in Charleston. Probably not even in well, maybe maybe a little bit more in Atlanta. But it was not. It was known in the Jewish community, and I applied and got in. And lo and behold, four months later, um, you have this takeover. It's one of the first takeover. It may have been the very first takeover of university building by by black students. It made the lead story in the evening news with Walter Cronkite that night. And um, it was a very you have to understand it was 1968 and it's a time uh, much like our own where there were deep deep divisions in the country you had the war in vietnam 
You had the Democratic uh, Convention in 1968, which it just exploded in demonstrations, um, resulting in you know, mass arrests. And um, <laughs> as a freshman, I remember uh, talking to people who were in Chicago in 1968. So they had all these war stories to tell. Um, and you have Mars Abram uh, coming to Brandeis thinking, uh, like his son-in-law told me, uh, he was going to turn it into Oxford. <laughs> he remembered his experience at Oxford, the idyllic experience where you sit on the lawn with a tutor and you read the great books. Um, and uh, the fact is that university presidents uh, were very limited in what they could achieve then. And were even less so when, um, when they had to face real crises like the, the, the situation he faced only about four years into his presidency. Um, and there were other problems at Brandeis. Uh, Brandeis had a very meager endowment, uh, which stood to reason it was a very young university. Um, there were financial headaches. Um, he handled it very, very well. And he was um, written up in the national press and the national media as having handled it very well. But, um, the, the demands continued, and um, as uh, a lot of the people who were, I spoke to who were there during the period recalled, he became more and more embittered as time went on. Um, mm -hmm. I think Steve Whitfield's in our audience, and maybe Steve uh, would be interested in talking about it. By the way, um, Steve Whitfield's just written, uh, Emeritus Professor of American Studies at Brandeis, has just written a marvelous new book about, about Brandeis. So, um, have to give give him a plug, and I heard a uh, a wonderful uh, talk that he gave this week about it. So yes, it had it had an impact on him. Um, and remember, this was also um, uh, a year after the the Six Day War, and uh, Morris Abram had been president of the American Jewish Committee during that period mm -hmm. and was watching the, 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 the old liberal coalition break up at that point. And um, he saw the liberal churches turning against Israel after the Six Day War. He saw all the problems related to um, uh, the splintering of black Jewish coalition um, in uh, around the same time. So yes, he was deeply affected by, by Brandeis and um, it, uh, it, it, it soured him in many, many ways um, about, uh, about uh, the, what was going on in the country at the time. Mm -hmm. And of course, he left in less than two years, which right. um, you claim, you point out in, his, in the book that it's one of the few, I'm not sure I'll call it a failure, but let's say a disappointment in the career of a man that was just marked by huge accomplishments and successes. Um, I mean, what, what was the takeaway lesson for Abram? Uh, do you think it changed the way he, he dealt with, uh, for example, with the civil rights movement afterwards? Well, maybe I'll find this one quicker. Um, David Harris, the president of the American Jewish Committee, who I interviewed, and of course, David Harris is, always expresses himself so well. Let me, let me read, uh, because I think he said it better than I could have. I said, David Harris, the longtime CEO of the American Jewish Committee, believes that Abram's personal political and ideological viewpoints were deeply affected by three related developments of the late 1960s. One was how many old friends and allies of Mars turned against Israel after the Six Day War. And I think this shocked and dismayed him. The people he thought were our natural partners flipped and turned against Israel. The second was how a number of people, particularly in the civil rights community, had left the Jews behind in places like Ocean Hill, Brownsville. Now that, that related to the, the uh, firing of teachers in the New York City school system um, after Mayor Lindsay tried to decentralize the school system. Wait a second, the African-American community had no better ally and partner than the Jewish community. And within the Jewish community, there were few people who were more frontline and outspoken and courageous than Morris Abram. And now we are reinvented as the enemy, as the other side. How can that be? You know, um, I'll interrupt here to say that um, 
um, the the those who had, who had taken over Ford Hall um, and put up a banner that tried to rename Brandeis Malcolm X University um, with all of the implications of that um, issued a statement in which they referred to uh, Morris Abram as a fork tongue uh, cracker, Southern cracker. And um, he, was a man, he was a man who had risked his life on behalf of blacks in the South. And uh, that, was, that was very hurtful, needful, need, needless to say. It, Harris continued, how can, the, how can this be? Now, I think the third thing was his experience as president of Brandeis. It was a short stint, but there were protesters, demonstrators trying to take over the president's office. That happened subsequent to, to Ford Hall, the, uh, the original takeover. I know from subsequent conversations that in Morris's mind, that kind of breakdown of the norms of civility, of inquiry, of open discussion, replaced instead by the mob, by intimidation, by occupation, I think really shook him to the core. Because at heart, he was a liberal in the best sense of the Western term. People would disagree with each other. They would do it civilly. They would listen to each other. They would form their own opinions. But there wasn't the thuggish quality to what was experienced on the college campuses in the late 1960s. I think those three events, which in some ways drew on each other, were all very formative in Morris's later political evolution. And yes, it deep, deep, deeply affected him. I talked to people who, um, from, from various walks of, of his life, who said that uh, he would frequently talk about that period in, in a very sad way. So. Mm -hmm. okay. So, um, Ashley, I'm going to ask you to start pitching questions. We've received some from email, and there are just a couple in the chat. I encourage, again, everyone and anyone who wants to type in a question into the chat, uh, we'll make our best effort to let everybody um, ask their question. Great. Okay, so uh, the first question I have is from Stephen Whitfield, who's here. Um, if you want to wave your hand, maybe you'll pop to the front of everyone's screen. Um, Stephen, would you like to read your question since you're here right now? And also, I believe um, David said you might have some comments about some of the history he shared. No, thanks for the thanks for the opportunity, Ashley, and and <laughs> hi, David, and hi, Dale. Hi, Steve. Be, be very brief because I actually have to get off for another Zoom with our grandsons in a few minutes. <laughs> But uh, my, my question really had to do, David, with a, a hypothetical that I know is unfair and objectionable on all sorts of grounds, having to do with what, what, what somebody who's no longer among us would have said about a contemporary problem. But the issue is given uh, the role that Morris Abram played in uh, Gray versus Sanders and in, in promoting the ideal of one person, one vote, can you guess what he would have said about recent efforts, particularly in his own native state of Georgia, your own native state, to suppress the votes of African Americans? Well, that's that's a that's a very tough question, um, and uh, I must say I don't know enough about the facts of that case. Um, I know it's become an issue that's been very politicized. Um, it's uh, it's something I'm sure would have distressed him. Um, uh, you know, uh, Morris Abram, as, as anybody who's read the book knows, um, really ended up um, uh, at odds with uh, his, his colleagues in the civil rights movement. Um, and most of that had to do with the issue, uh, not of voter suppression, um, by the way, Abram thought, he, Abram criticized the Reagan administration for opposing the extension of the Voting Rights Act. Um, but it had to do with, with um, the issue of, of what, is, what is mistermed affirmative action. And so maybe Steve, if you'll permit me, maybe to talk a little bit more about that. Um, I, I would say due to the poverty of language these days, there's been a, um, uh, a, a problem of terminology. Morris Abram was very much in favor of the original idea of affirmative action, which was to um, cast the net very widely, to eliminate the old boys network that used to keep blacks from even knowing about recruitment for jobs and things like that. 
But it, what it has, tur has turned into since uh, that early period is, is a system of racial preference. And he was very much opposed to that. He believed that discrimination was wrong, no matter what the intention was. He did it on, on two major grounds. One was the ground of the law, the rule of law. He always believed it was the rule of law that holds this country together. And it was a viol clear violation of the 14th Amendment of the United States Constitution, which talks not about group rights, but about individual rights. And he said it was a clear a violation of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, both the letter and the spirit of the law. But he also thought that it would lead to all kinds of problems in this country, uh, what he considered balkanization. You know, this is a pluralistic country, country made up of all kinds of groups that have all sorts of grievances. And he, as he put it, he says, um, eventually we'll all be at each other's throats. And um, we have been, uh, not necessarily because of that one issue. Um, but I think he was, he was um, prophetic in many ways. And I could talk more about the issue. People want to talk more about this question. Uh, I'd be happy to do that. On, back to voter suppression, Steve, I just uh, assume that he would be on the side of uh, uh, being very um, much in favor of anything that would uh, address that problem. So next we move on to Jeremy Katz. I'm not sure if Jeremy Katz is able to speak right now. Um, Jeremy, are you there? No? Okay. So Jeremy posted two questions in the chat. His questions are, did anti-Semitism or the aftermath of Leo Frank play a role in his career or worldview? And the other question is, did he have a relationship with Elliot Levitas, who later won the seat he ran for in the House? Good questions, both of them. Uh, yes and yes. Um, and um, let's get back to Leo Frank. Uh, uh, Elliot Levitas, I interviewed for the book, and he's quoted in the book. Um, Elliot, uh, our folks in Atlanta will know, will know who he is. Um, after the... Um, uh, George's electoral system was um, reformed as a result of um, the elimination of the county unit system. And you had a popular vote um, determining the outcome in the uh, fourth congressional district in Atlanta. Levitas won that, um, won that seat. Now, what's very interesting is that Elia Levitas first met Morris Abram in the 1950s after he was named as a Rhodes Scholar. And uh, he was invited to dinner with um, Morris and his wife, Jane. Uh, and they had a very, very nice discussion. And later, Elliot joined the pro bono team who were doing research on, uh, on the county unit cases. Um, so yes, he, he, he knew Morris as well. Morris, yes, had run for that seat in 1954. Uh, he described it as the nastiest campaign ever held because during that year, uh, the Supreme Court had handed down the Brown decision and uh, he was running against a uh, former member of the Ku Klux Klan um, who later became uh, a state judge. And um, so, yes, I mean, he did know Elliot Levitas and um, Elliot Levitas uh, thought very highly of Morris Abram. Um, yes, the Leo Frank case cast a shadow over the state of Georgia, and uh, no question about that. And um, there is a wonderful story that I did not tell in the book that Abram tells about uh, meeting Governor Slayton. I'm trying to recall the facts. And uh, there's actually quite an interesting story behind it. Governor Slayton was the governor, was it Slayton? I think it was Slayton. The governor who um, commuted the sentence of Leo Frank. And then, of course, tragically, uh, he was, uh, they, the Klan attacked his uh, cell and, and lynched him. But um, Morris Abram met Slayton under a very, very funny circumstance. Um, he had failed the Georgia bar 
Lars Abram. And he, he claimed, uh, always claimed it was because he had bad handwriting. And somehow that led him to meet the governor who I think was on the board. I think he was appealing to his, the decision. He was on the bar, the bar Association board. This was long after he had left office. And Abram asked the governor why he did that. Why he, he was, of course, inter <laughs> very interested in, in, in everything. And the governor, um, as I recall, told him that his wife said, how can you live with yourself if you don't do that, knowing that Frank was innocent? And I thought that was a very interesting story. And yes, there's no question that you could not have grown up in, when Morris Abram did in the state of Georgia and not, not been affected by, by the Leo Frank trial. We have one more follow-up question from Jeremy that he just sent um, about Abram's relationship with Robert Kennedy. He'd like to know, did Abram assist with the Kennedy campaign's effort to release Martin Luther King from prison after being arrested during a sit-in at Riches? Wow. Um, yes, he was very involved in, uh, in that effort to release King, and uh, I devote a, a good amount of attention to that. Um, <clears throat> by the way, Robert, Robert Kennedy was furious when he heard that um, his, um, one of his assistants, uh, Harris Wofford, uh, who worked with Sergeant Shriver, uh, Kennedy's brother-in-law, had gotten involved in that case. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fascinating story. Um, Kennedy um, later intervened with the judge that helped a, a King get out of prison. And I recommend that you get the book and, and read. It's a very complicated story, a very interesting story. And when um, the case of Gray versus Sanders, the county unit case, went to the Supreme Court, Robert Kennedy decided that he would argue that case before the court himself. I tell the story in the book. Kennedy became the, um, it, it, the case it was the occasion of the only time he ever entered a courtroom. And he ar argued the government's case. Um, and uh, they became close. And as I said, Kennedy tried to encourage Abram to run against Javits in, Javits in 1968. Um, and uh, of course, that never happened. But they, um, they shared the platform at a Democratic Party dinner in Manhattan um, in, I guess it was 1967. Um, and uh, Abram was the master of ceremonies at that dinner. And Kennedy <clears throat> gave a speech in which he said, he quipped, you know, there's talk of, um, of, of Abram uh, running for the Senate next year. He said, but I can't believe that the people of New York would vote for a carpetbagger who doesn't speak with a New York accent. That was one of my favorite anecdotes from the book. <laughs> um, okay, so next we have David Popowski, who I think is here. David, would you like to ask your question? You have to unmute yourself. Okay, now. Okay, so David and I go back 60 years. So uh, I had to call David him still resentful him. that David still resentful that Savannah beat Charleston in, in basketball. Yeah, the whole game they beat ten, ten to eight was the final score. <laughs> right. But not so resentful because he said he actually set up this. He he was the okay. matchmaker. <laughs> so let's fast forward to our eight, our Olive Zadik Olive days, our AZA days. My first trip to Savannah for a convention. And I see Michael Goodman, your cousin, on, uh, on here, too. He'll remember this. I know that. He'll like this. Dr. William Wexler. A big thing, a deal was made about Dr. William Wexler. And Dr. Wexler was from Savannah, and he became the president of B'nai B'rith International, which was a big deal back then. And Morris Abram and Dr. William Wexler were the only Southern Jews that I knew of that led a major Jewish organization in America. Uh, did they know each other? Were they acquainted? I, I saw in the index there wasn't anything about it, Dr. Wexler in the book, but you might elaborate on him and answer my very short question. <laughs> I know that when I um, 
went to Brandeis in 1960, when, when um, just before I left for Brandeis, I got calls from a number of um, uh, folks in Savannah who uh, wanted me to give Morris Abram their regards. Um, by then, Wexler was no longer living in Savannah. I think he was living in Israel by then. Um, and um, so I don't, I can't answer your question specifically. By the way, my mother's first job, my father I think is in the audience and might confirm this. Uh, my mother's first job was working for Bill Wexler, who, who was an optometrist in Savannah. Um, I know that um, uh, Morris Abram was very close to Judge Clark in Savannah. And I read the letters in the file uh, when he was selected to be president of Brandeis, and uh, many of them came from from Savannah. Um, yes, he was he was he was very friendly with with a lot of folks there, and I imagine his paths would have crossed with with him with with Dr. Wexler. Okay, and then we have one final question from Alexander Miles. If Alexander's here. Oh, is that Miles Alexander? Or Miles Alexander. Yes. Yes, I'm here. It's Miles Alexander, not Alexander Miles. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> That's fine. Go ahead and read the question if you would. Oh, sure. Uh, did Vernon Jordan and Morris ever make peace after Morris declined to put Vernon up for partnership at Paul Weiss? <laughs> The answer is yes. Um, let me let me go back to that and let me pay tribute to Miles Alexander, who is a, a wonderful person who I interviewed for the book, um, and um, was a an important fit has been an important figure in the uh, in the legal community in Atlanta and in the American the Jewish community of Atlanta, past chairman of uh, of AJC there. Um, the question has to do with, with Vernon Jordan, and um, Vernon Jordan was in some ways a protege of Morris Abram. Uh, and when, um, and I interviewed him for the book, and I was aware of the fact that there had been a, some personal issues between the two of them surrounding the question of um, uh, Jordan's attempt to get a partnership at Morris Abrams firm. It's a, it's a story that um, I don't want to get into now. But the answer to the question is yes, they did reconcile. And Vernon Jordan had some very, very nice things to say about Morris Abram. Uh, one of them I actually quote toward the end of the book. And Vernon Jordan also, when Morris Abram was living in Geneva, in the last decade of his life, um, he hosted Vernon Jordan and his wife there. And so, you know, Morris Abram, um, although he had many um, sharp disagreements on policy with, with old comrades and colleagues, um, a lot of the people that I interviewed said um, that he never took it personally and that he always listened to the, the opposing position and how much respect they had for that. And uh, he was always open-minded and he always wanted to learn more and more up until, as his son Joshua said, up until the day he died. So I hope, Miles, that answers your question. It does, and thank you very much for doing this. Pleasure. <clears throat> Oh, I just wanted to um, break in here, and, and I don't want to put anybody on the spot, but we, ha we have some ringers in the audience here, people who knew Morris Abram, including his daughter, Ruth. And I would love to hear from Janice, Cecily, Ruth. Um, uh, I'd love to just bring you into the conversation and let, let you share your memories. Um, and by the way, we're, we're going to... Ashley and I have been chatting privately. We're going to let us let the so-called official session go till uh, at least 11.15 since we have plenty of time. Um, and uh, uh, so we'll be able to get everybody's uh, input from the chat room, etc. Janice, do you want to say something? Can you unmute yourself? 
Well, I enjoyed the book very much. I thought it was wonderful. Um, and actually, I suppose I knew Morris before anybody on this program did, even his daughter, Ruth, because <laughs> we met in um, the late 30s when he was graduating the University of Georgia and I was in high school. But even then, the uh, leading Jewish attorney, certainly in Atlanta, understood that they had a real star arising there. And uh, their wives, uh, uh, I suppose, uh, uh, were in, in, in league with each other, inviting Morris for the weekend um, and inviting as many of us girls of a proper age to meet him as possible at a party. So um, I've, I've felt uh, a very warm friendship with Morris uh, all, all of our lives since then. Um, Carlin Fisher, who was Carlin Feldman at the time, was one of the girls who was introduced to him, I'm sure with um, the idea that this would help bring him to settle in Atlanta. And uh, actually Carlin did not at the time, but uh, later in life when both of them were single, they did, well, they did marry. And um, my husband, my second husband, well, both of my husbands were very much together with Morris and the work that he was doing because in Atlanta, it, my husband was the rabbi of the temple um, that Morris came to work for when he needed a little bit of extra income. And we were close friends uh, throughout uh, all of those years. Um, Rebecca Gershon, I think should be mentioned because she was a leader, a formidable leader um, in, in both the general community of Atlanta. She was an early activist uh, for civil rights, much earlier than any of us realized that it was even a problem. Um, and she helped to introduce Morris to other people when he first moved to Atlanta. Uh, what else can I say? Then um, in the second part of our lives, um, when, when he married Carlin, uh, I was widowed and remarried. And my husband, David Bloomberg, succeeded Bill Wexler as president of International uh, B'nai B'rith. And so um, we saw them a great deal in, uh, you know, in, in our travels actually around the world when it came to um, uh, issues such as uh, Soviet Jewry and anything to do with Israel. So I feel I've always had a great, great admiration for Morris um, and still do. I think he's one of the great men of our lifetime. That's a wonderful testament. Cicely, I don't know, are you willing to say a few words? This is a niece. A, a sure, little niece. and I, I see, I see yeah. that. And I want to thank Janice for her help on the book. I had a wonderful interview with her and it was great to get to know her. And I do include in the book the fact that in 1968 at Morris Abrams inaugural at Brandeis, Rabbi Rothschild and Janice were present. Um, and Rabbi Rothschild gave the invocation. And, I, and, and you mentioned that Ruth, I'm so delighted that Ruth Abram has joined us. Um, and, uh, and maybe Ruth would want to say, say something. If you, if you unmute. I see where she's unmuting. <laughs> okay. Ruth, you have to unmute yourself. Okay. Um, first of all, David, I think you did a wonderful job with the book and I felt you captured so much about him. I, I guess I just wanted to add something about the uh, issue at Brandeis. I was attending the Heller School at Brandeis when the African-American students took over uh, Ford Hall. And one of the things that um, we had had 
my father, myself, my husband and I, many discussions about his stand on affirmative action. And my husband and I would say, well, don't you believe that the pool should be enlarged so that when the, it comes to choosing people, you could at least see uh, black people in that pool and other kinds of people? And he said, of course, of course I believe that. And we would say, well, why don't you say that instead of saying I'm against affirmative action? And he couldn't bring himself. I think he was too, I think having been in his mind thrown out of the liberal left community, he had nowhere to go but the Republicans and he embraced them and he did not wish to do, to say something that would inflame them and have them send him out too. That was my impression. So I, I don't know that, you, I don't, uh, you know, he was the father of five children and he was a very ex excited father. He liked being with us and we liked being with him. Um, later on in his life, as he kept divorcing and marrying, it got, it, it got much harder for everybody. And we were left with the uh, detritus of those experiences. So, but thank you so much for doing this and for doing the book, David. Appreciate thank it. you very much, Ruth. And um, I should point out, as many of you probably know, Ruth is the founder of the Lower East Side Tenement Museum in, <clears throat> in, um, in Manhattan and has been very, very active in many progressive causes over, over the years. You know, <clears throat> Ruth just used the expression liberal left, and it's, it's something that Ashley and I have talked about in regards to Morris Abram in the book. Um, it's very clear Morris Abram was a liberal and always a liberal. I don't think he moved one iota off his fundamental principles. But whether he was a leftist or not, um, David, you come out at the end of the book and saying he was really never on the left. Do you, do you want to talk about that or just Ruth, Ruth, maybe you would want to say a word about that. I can say that. that from in Atlanta, Georgia in the 50s, he was considered by many people off the charts. So in that regard, <laughs> but later on, you know, these definitions change. I think you are quite right. He was more centrist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. You know, in 1954, when he ran against James Davis uh, in that congressional seat, uh, Davis said he was a communist um, because he belonged to the ACLU. Um, but um, in the, I think we need to, to, to get better with our terms, just like right. affirmative action and, and racial preference. Uh, liberal is not necessarily left, as we've learned painfully here in this country. Um, and um, it was uh, it was really the uh, experience at Brandeis which highlighted that for Abram. Um, you know, he he believed in the liberal values of free expression, um, freedom. Um, you know, argue ideas, don't try to suppress them, and uh, he. Um, unfortunately came along at the wrong time in the wrong place at Brandeis. He, he gave, can you hear me? No. Yes. He gave a wonderful speech at Brandeis impromptu uh, to the, all the kids who had taken over Forward Hall and others. And when one of the uh, students, a, a black student, I think, got up to uh, say that he, that my father was so bound up by rules and by regulations and by protocol. He did a beautiful speech on how rules and regulations and laws had made it possible for them to be at Brandeis today and had prevented them and their parents from being lynched or being put in jail and on and on. It was just so powerful and the, the um, the other thing is, he told me that a number of the students had snuck out of Ford Hall to ask him for help doing something else, advancing their careers. So I thought that was an interesting thing. Mm. Thank you. Should I, I, I'd like to say, um, I, I wish I could identify everybody that I know here, but I want to also call attention to the fact that uh, Cecily Abram is with us, who is the daughter of Morris's older brother, 
Dr. Lewis Abram. And Cecily is actually somewhat of a neighbor of mine and was also very helpful to me with the book. Mm -hmm. Well, David, I just admire what you have done. I have been so interested in this subject for years and you did it, you did the book, I love it. And I just wanted to say that I would love to see the papers at Emory looked at much more often and organized in a way that scholars that, that want to study this period in this man could um, access it. Do you agree? <laughs> yes, um, the papers are extremely helpful to me, but um, they do need some work. <laughs> he, and, 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 you know, he was a guy who, who, who saved everything. Yeah. Yeah. And um, and who corresponded with everybody in the world? So, That's fascinating. Uh, yeah, I think it would be great to, yeah. to to get in there and 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 sort of as and and if if they could ever be indexed, that would be particularly helpful. Yeah. Wonderful. I I, I just okay. like to say, uh, Cecily and I were at the the meeting of the Southern Jewish Historical Society in Charlottesville. She complained to me bitterly that Emory had not done a good job with the Morris Abram papers and um, Eric Goldstein was there and some other people. And lo and behold, about a month later, across, uh, I, got, I got a notice saying that Emory was looking for a, uh, an archivist, a processing archivist dedicated to doing that one collection. So I think you, you were heard, Cecily, at that meeting. Yeah, I hope uh, so. And that is, you know, yeah, being a, right. a squeaky wheel is sometimes effective. <laughs> okay. Thank well, you actually, so much, Dale. You're welcome. It's just a pleasure to see you. I wish it was in person. Be good. I'm in Sagaponic, New York. <laughs> and I'm in McClellanville, South Carolina. Uh-huh. Uh, Ashley, do we have a couple of other questions in the chat? Yeah, so um, we're quickly approaching the point to where we're going to um, end this session. If you want to stay on and talk to David, you're more than welcome to. But we do have two final questions, both having to do with the question of legacy. So I think this is a good way to end. Um, and then I'm going to add on just one final question as well. Um, so from Harry Kustik, he um, is teaching Georgia history at a private school, and he really wants his students to understand the impact of the forces and movements within the state of Georgia. And so he asks, what do you consider to be Morris's more important contributions to the racial and political landscape of Georgia? And then we have another question that's asked anonymously about how you would just summarize Abrams, um, Abrams legacy, both nationally and internationally. And then I'd like to hear about uh, your next book. So <laughs> all of that. <laughs> <laughs> All in five minutes. Um, Harry, thanks for the question. Harry Custick is my first cousin, lives in the Atlanta area. Harry, the um, gravestone in Cape Cod, it's a very simple gravestone, um, says Mars Berthold Abram, 1918 to the year 2000. He established one man, one vote. Uh, as a principle of American jurisprudence. And that really um, was what he wanted to be his legacy. And certainly, if you look at the state of Georgia and you look at the, um, uh, the trajectory of politics in the state of Georgia, it had a huge, huge impact. Jimmy Carter called it um, the most important decision um, for the state of Georgia in a century. And interestingly enough, that decision uh, helped launch Jimmy Carter's political career. Um, so uh, you no longer had a, 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 the, the Marvin Griffins and the, and the Ernest Vandivers, you had uh, the you know, Carl Sanders and the um, George Busby's as governor and Jimmy Carter, of course. Um, so yes, um, that would be his, his legacy in terms of, uh, of Georgia. David, there was quite a disagreement among the siblings about that stone. Because, as you surely are aware, the decision was one person, one vote. And some of us wanted uh, 
he had called it one man, one vote, much to right. my dismay. Right. Um, but the, I lost out on the vote about whether to use his language or the language of the Supreme Court. So. Yeah, you're quite right. Uh, Justice Douglas, in his opinion, William Douglas, in his opinion, used the term one person, one vote. Yes. Um, so, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a bit of a dilemma. And I think Ruth Fitzgerald, which did the mural, um, actually, uh, at your insistence, changed it. Yes, he <laughs> <I> did. <laughs> Small change. Bravo, Ruth. Oh, I'm sorry, there was a second question. Oh, internationally, um, you know, we haven't really said much about UN Watch, but UN Watch is really a terrific organization which calls out, um, you know, the great, first of all, it calls out the, um, the obsession of the UN with uh, the UN Human Rights Council with the State of Israel. Um, but it also calls out dictators around the world um, who uh, manage to get on the Human Rights Council so that they won't have um, investigations of their human rights practices. Morris Abram believed deeply in international human rights. He helped draft the Convention on Anti-Discrimination um, at uh, the UN when he served in the early 1960s in the Kennedy and Johnson administrations. Um, and so I would um, urge everybody here who's not familiar with that organization to learn more about it, become involved, um, because I think it, it really does really terrific work. And I'm happy to stay as long as people want to ask questions. <laughs> would you share about your next book? Oh, the next book I'm writing, um, I'm collaborating uh, this time, and that, that's a new experience with a former colleague of mine on a biography of a man whose name unfortunately will not be known to this audience uh, or really many other audiences in the United States. He's more well known in Europe and Germany and England where he spent uh, his life after World War II. Uh, also the son of immigrants to the United States, um, a man named Melvin J. Lasky who became one of the great intellectuals of the anti-communist left at City College with Irving Howe and Irving Kristol and Marty Lipset in, in the 1930s. And um, so it's an interesting story and um, I'll be busy with that, uh, I assume for the next several years. Wonderful, I look forward to it. Thank Anyone, you. Any final comments? Denise, yeah. I think if you read this particular section carefully, you might um, um, come to the conclusion that it is possible that Morris Abram turned the tide of election so that uh, John Kennedy won the election and became our president. I think that's a fascinating, to me, it's a fascinating part of the story and um, part of his story. Um, our story. If you give me, can you give me two minutes? Sure. Okay. That's Janice, thank beautiful. you. You're, you're, absolute, you're absolutely right. Um, when uh, Abram played a role in uh, helping um, free Martin Luther King from prison, he had um, led a student protest against Rich's department store at, uh, in Atlanta and um, trying to integrate the restaurant there. And um, when he uh, was, when those charges were dropped, he was immediately rearrested on a, on a ridiculous uh, 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 expired driver's license charge and was um, sentenced to four months of hard labor in, um, in uh, Reedsville, Georgia. And his wife was pregnant, Coretta was pregnant. She was a client of Morris Abram. She was pregnant at the time. And then she got a call from President Kennedy, which uh, reassured her, and then Bobby Kennedy got involved. And so uh, Martin Luther King had said that he was, would not endorse a candidate for president in 1960, but his father, who had favored Richard Nixon, that's right, Daddy King had favored Nixon because of the Catholic issue, um, changed his mind, changed his position, uh, as a result of the Kennedy um, intervention in uh, the, K the King case before the election. 
And um, Morris Abram said to, and he was also a client of, of Morris Abram, and, and Morris Abram convinced him to make that public, to make that switch public. And he made a speech uh, right the Sunday before the election at the Ebenezer Baptist Church. And it felt like that um, endorsement uh, helped swing a lot of um, black folks in the North. And of course the election was, was razor thin, was had a razor thin margin. And so who knows, um, maybe that did, uh, did make, a, make a difference to the outcome. You know, it's very clear from this conversation that this guy, Morris Abrams, it was like a pebble in a, in a pond. He had re repercussions of his work and his beliefs uh, far and wide that probably are not recognized, but now hopefully will be um, with this really marvelous book. I want to hold up the cover because it's such a beautiful cover and a great title. Um, um, I think we, you know, for the sake of those who have been hanging with us, want to say that anyone who wants to um, drop out, please feel free. But I know I have some more questions um, for David. And if anyone else does or wants to talk to him uh, in a you know, slightly more intimate setting, um, we will keep the, keep the Zoom room open for a while. Um, and and if, if I can just start with that, I don't know if Ruth has, has left or not. I don't see her on my screen. But um, one, one thing uh, we haven't talked about much is gender politics. Um, and um, you know the feminist movement, uh, which he also was, you know, uh, a witness to. Um, he's been described as a great listener, deeply empathetic, but um, Abram was also, and I quote, a powerful alpha male. Um, David and and any of the other folks who knew him personally, um, how did he balance these contradictory aspects of his character? Oh, um, <laughs> you know, this is Sorry. not, this was not a personal biography. It was more about his career and about his views and so forth. He did have three marriages. Um, and um, the person who used that term, alpha male, uh, someone uh, named Linda Chavez. Linda Chavez was the staff director of the uh, U.S. Commission on Civil Rights when Morris Abram was its vice chairman under President Reagan. And um, I've since become friendly with Linda, and um, she talks a lot about how much she more ad admired Morris Abram. Um, I do mention that he got involved in the uh, issue of comparable worth. And again, sticking to his principles, he believed that um, decisions about employment um, should not be made by bureaucrats. It should be made by the people who employ them. And so he was, he was criticized for that. And um, again, buy the book, read about it. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, he, 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 he had his faults. He had his shortcomings. I say it in the, uh, in the introduction. I made it quite clear. Um, you know, nobody is, 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 is perfect. You know, um, I interviewed someone, I guess I can't use the person's name because this one little slither went off the record. And he said to me, uh, are you writing a biography or a hagiography? Uh, hagiography, of course, is the biography of, of saints. <laughs> and I said, uh, a biography. I want, to, um, I want to take the evidence wherever it leads me. I said, but if I were not an admirer of Morris Abram, I would not have undertaken this project. Whereupon he said, and this is someone who had, um, had been very critical of, of some of the things that Abram did, uh, mainly when he was chairman of the Conference on Soviet Jury. Um, he said, um, I was an 80% admirer. Hmm. We move to a more informal format where if people just want to speak up, you're more than welcome to, or raise your hand and we can call. I think we'd like to allow people now the opportunity to chat with David um, on a very informal level. I'll ask a question. Uh -huh. David, <laughs> the lawyer and me, I've done a few medical malpractice cases uh, and uh, Cicely's on, I see there. And your father's a doctor, right? Uh, her, uh, yeah, Mort Saban's father, 
brother was a doctor. I uh, was fascinated. He was doing medical malpractice cases, the most difficult of lawsuits because it's hard to sue a doctor um, in the early 50s. And that took some guts back then. And you know, you get, other than what you've said in your book about it, he did what very well financially with those cases. Um, yeah, there was well. one. In, there was one in particular that was the uh, highest. Um, it was the highest uh, uh, award ever given in DeKalb County to that point. It was um, a, a very um, unsettling case that had to do with um, someone who had who had um, who had brought uh, a suit uh, uh, because she had gone brain uh, had had brain significant brain injury during surgery. It took him three years. It showed how persistent he was. Um, you know, when Morris Abram, I mentioned when Morris Abram went to the University of Georgia, first he wanted to be a rabbi, and he didn't know Hebrew. Uh, he didn't know how to read Hebrew. Uh, and then he saw that, um, that uh, uh, the local rabbi was having to be, he has to be, had to be, pardon my expression, a real ass kisser. He didn't like that. So he quickly decided he didn't want to do that. But then he said he wanted to be a doctor. He was, he originally, in his freshman year, he said he wanted to be pre-med. And like his brother, whom he admired greatly, um, who became an allergist. Um, but then he realized that his drawings um, of animals were, were, were not as good as some of the other students. And so he dropped out, but he, he always had that interest uh, in medicine. And so, David, you're right to call uh, attention to that because um, he took great pride in um, his knowledge of medicine. And when he became a patient at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York, he is credited with doing things. He, he had great admiration for his, his physicians, but he did not have great admiration for the administration of the hospital. And he complained at various points during his, um, his stay there about how things were not being run correctly. And he believed that these things that he called attention to, um, if they had not been corrected, might have led to his death. OK, thanks. David, I'm going to jump in. Um, I hope other people are thinking of things they'd like to ask. But um, it occurred to me, uh, reading the book, uh, to ask you, would you say he, he courted controversy? I mean, it was clear he courted power, uh, but he was a little, seemed to be a little bit in love with the limelight. I would say yes. Um, he, did, he didn't shy away from controversy. Um, he, he had great uh, ability to withstand the way he was being attacked um, in the civil rights community. But um, while, he didn't, uh, while he didn't look for controversy, um, he loved to hear people express their views. And he perfected uh, this in his, uh, one thing we didn't really talk about <clears throat> was his, um, when he stayed in Geneva after he was the ambassador, he became the ambassador to the UN. And the reason it was in Geneva was because that's where all the specialized agencies of the UN are located. He was the ambassador under President Bush number one. And uh, he stayed on after being ambassador to found UN Watch. He married uh, someone who was um, actually significantly younger, who was still working, who was uh, uh, working in, at the UN in Geneva. And uh, she's still around today. She's a lovely woman who was helpful also on the book. And um, they used to hold these dinners at his home. He did this on Cape Cod during the summer as well in which he would invite uh, a, a not unwieldy group. So it was small enough to have a discussion 
And when the dessert was being served, he would say, all right, let's talk about something tonight. Um, let's talk about the situation in Bosnia, for example. And then he would sit back and listen and uh, collect all kinds of different views and people would engage with one another. And this is really how he was able to maintain his influence even though he was no longer the ambassador in Geneva. Um, and so while he was, yes, someone who did not shy away from controversy, he enjoyed people's clashing of ideas. He also had extraordinary access to the media. I mean, I feel like there was sort of a, almost a motif through the book every, at every critical juncture you write. And then he wrote an op-ed for the New York Times. Well, uh, yes, and course, indeed, it, indeed. And it got him into trouble at Brandeis because mm -hmm. um, you'll remember that, and, and I certainly remember, I was there. I think one of the turning points, because remember he'd been praised by the media um, for how he handled the Ford Hall controversy uh, with the black students. Um, not calling in law enforcement, you know, being willing to compromise on uh, the major points. But he got into some real trouble um, when uh, he did an interview with the New York Times and he said that, uh, yes, Brandeis is going to have a law school. It should have a law school, you know, it's named after the first Jewish Supreme Court justice. Now, he had had an offer from a female donor uh, for a law, for a building, for a law school. But he had, he had never, he may have mentioned it to a few people on the faculty, but he never raised this with the faculty, with the board. And so all hell broke loose when the New York Times publishes an article, Brandeis to have a law school, president says. <laughs> well, um, faculties don't like to have things done behind their back and boards of directors don't either. Um, it was a disaster for him. Uh, and he got into trouble again uh, when he was chairman of the National Conference on Soviet Jury and he made a trip to the Soviet Union with Edgar Bronfman and then they tried to negotiate uh, the release of, and again, he comes back and he talks to the press about it without sharing it with some of the key players in, in the U.S. So he, he, yes, his relationship with the press was again um, to his advantage, but also worked to his disadvantage in a couple of key cases. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm always impressed by the power of the New York Times. <laughs> and don't forget, he did that series of interviews about his illness. Yeah. And so people were following this, you know, uh, personally, like, you know, what's going to happen to this guy? So. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to ask about the episode. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing this correctly, but the Starrett City episode. In oh, yes. The public housing, because I thought that was a really, really interesting right. it um, is. It is. kind of point in his life and the, the right. view he decided to take. Could you talk a little bit right. about that? Right. Okay. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to bore anybody, but I agree. This is really fast. I, I debated whether to get involved with, uh, with this. Um, I remember when I was at ADL in the 1980s, ADL took a very strong position against uh, racial quotas. And we debated Starrett City. Now, Starrett City was a housing pro is it's no longer called Starrett City, is a massive housing project in uh, the East New York section of Brooklyn. Um, it was, I think at the time, and maybe still one of the, the most subsidized, uh, had the highest level of subsidy of any public housing um, pro uh, project in the country. And they, it was integrated and they, they uh, were impl implemented a rule which was called a benign quota, in quotes. 
Um, remember, Morris Abram was never used the term benign quota. He thought quotas were terrible. They kept Jews out of universities in the you know 30s and 40s, and um, they're just really terrible, when, particularly when they're when they're used on on a racial and ethnic basis. But what Starrett City, uh, the people who led Starrett City uh, said was, we have a very, very successful housing project because we have limited the number of Blacks, uh, and at the time it was 35%, because they believed in a theory called the tipping point, meaning that once you get to a certain level of African Americans, um, you're going to cause the white population to leave, and you're going to be left with a non-integrated facility. And um, a lawsuit was initiated on behalf of um, a number of people who had been left on a wait. In other words, we're going to have a waiting list for Blacks. And um, we're gonna go through the waiting list, but when we get to the point of 35%, we're gonna close it. And so uh, a suit was brought in and that's when Starrett City went to Morris Abram. And Morris Abram's position was that my client, he, he, he believed in this idea of the tipping point, or at least, you know, he was, at, where's David? He's a good lawyer. And certainly that's, that's, <laughs> that's where his, uh, that's what his client believed. And he also said that the Fair Housing Act of 1968, um, what the, the purpose of the act was to, um, uh, was to integrate housing. And here you have a model. You have a model which can be destroyed if, according to this theory again, the um, the tipping point is uh, is is reached, and so um, when I went into his, I was debating whether to use that. And then when I went into his papers, I saw there was a whole box <laughs> related to this. Now he was nearing the end of his career at Paul Weiss, the, the, his firm in New York, and yet he was even after he became no longer the attorney of record when this case was appealed. He was very engaged in this case. He deeply believed in it. And yet he was attacked in all kinds of ways in the New York Times and in the Village Voice and in the New Republic. And the Times really was not so much critical as analytical, um, but they did point out that he was a guy who, whose life was devoted to the idea of non-discrimination, defending what was in effect um, a benign quota. So that's the story of Sarit City, and um, you can make it of it what you want. But I thought it was an interesting story that needed to be included. It makes me, it makes me wonder about um, the extent to which you were able to pull out of his papers the kind of internal debates he felt, or maybe through interviewing friends and family, whether there was ever doubt in his mind as he was facing these cases and the questions of affirmative action or quotas and the ways in which they counteracted his liberal principles? Um, no, they didn't. He believed firmly that they didn't counteract. He believed that they supported his liberal principles. Okay. And he believed that um, the law is the foundation um, and that these, these vi violated uh, all sorts of principles. Now, um, well, I won't get into it because it becomes, it becomes more my view than his view, but, um, uh, he, he, he was, he, he said, you know, it, just because liberalism is being redefined doesn't mean that my views should change. Mm -hmm. My views are my views and that's, so he, he, he really didn't have a problem with that at all. Yeah, that's a really good way to summarize the tension there. Mm -hmm. could, I, could I ask a favor? Um, I see where my good friend Bob Hicks is still on the line. Bob, do you hear me? My, Bob is um, a gentleman who 
was a partner with Morris Abram in his law firm in Atlanta in the 1950s. He's 94 years old and um, gave me some of the best interviews that I had. Other than members, other than Morris Abrams' children, five children, all of whom spoke at his funeral, Bob gave the principal eulogy. And he is now in Atlanta, living in Atlanta. So anyway, I was glad he was able to join at least for some of the time. He, he, may, he may not uh, know how to unmute, but if he can unmute, we'd love to hear from him. Well, I know we've kept everybody longer even than we said we would, but we did keep the Zoom room open till noon. So um, I guess I, I'll close off here with a huge thank you uh, to David Lowe uh, for writing the book and for agreeing to come and talk to all of us. Um, I oh, excuse me, Dale. I see yeah. you. Well, I just got on. I've looked, at, I've seen the whole thing and heard it, but this is, I'm 94 years old, and I, I, this is my first experience with Zoom, but I am delighted to be here with you and delighted to have been with you. Uh, it's been a, a remarkable experience for me. And David, I can tell you that I finally found the remarks I made at Morris's funeral, and I'll send them to you there. Uh, Bob, Bob yes. I should have told you I was able to get them from Geneva. Oh, you from uh, okay. from one of Morris Abrams' associates at UN Watch. Okay, well, good. I I I thought a lot of Morris Abrams. I knew him from 1948 until the day of his death, and we were close. But I've learned so much more about him from you than I knew myself. I he was a in, indeed an individual of remarkable talents and. And as I don't know who said it, but he made you feel you were the center of his orbit. You were always important. And I knew that most of those years I was nothing. <laughs> I remember one time I went to New York, and I don't know if I told you this, but it's important to know it because it's, it's typical of Morris. I'm a little boy from Dublin, Georgia, and and I was in New York City one day and I had to wait about four or five hours for an airplane. And I thought, well, I believe I'll just stop in and see Morris. And I went to his office and I asked, I asked to see him. And the lady said, I'm sorry, Mr. Abram is extremely busy. There's no chance. And I said, well, uh, Mr. Abram, uh, I don't necessarily have to see him. I just tell him that uh, that I'm here, and that if I could borrow a hundred dollars, uh, he could send it out, and I could spare him the time. And he ran out of his office with his arms in the air and said, "Weak, weak." <laughs> My name was Weak Hicks, and I have a brother <laughs> named John who's named Strong Hicks, and, and he, that greeting was was typical of Morris. Um, uh, yeah, I was a nobody, and and he made me somebody. That's why. <laughs> and uh, I had some experiences with him in a taxi cab with a Jewish boy named Jaime something one time, and I kidded Morris for years about Morris. To Jaime, you're somebody. The Pope is to the Pope. You're nobody. Why is it you always aspire to some level? when people worship you from down here, you try to climb all the time. But anyhow, he was a great friend of mine and I'm delighted to share with you the love and affection I had for that man. He introduced me to my current wife and I'm deeply grateful to him, deeply grateful. And uh, I could talk about Morris Abram forever, but it's time to stop now. <laughs> and David, thank you for your book. It was. It was a privilege. I bought four or five copies, and it didn't take any time to get rid of them. I tell you. So you, so you were, so you were the one. <laughs> who bought, who bought the book? <laughs> so uh, yeah, I bought your book and I sent it around to to friends. Well, I appreciate but that. I wish and, I'd uh, ask, I was, I wish I'd asked my brother John Strong Hicks to yeah. be with us today. I, 
I don't know why I didn't, but I, this is, as I say, my first experience, and it's a remarkable time. This Zoom is great. I, I'm delighted <laughs> to get a, finally get rid of it. I was afraid I wouldn't own you. And how, how you got me on, I don't know, but I, it says mute and unmute and put yourself on me. <laughs> so here I am. And thank you for the And, and thank the, you for all your the, service the, and your help with the book. And David, uh, you are going to be very grateful to these people for doing this because it, 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 it got me acquainted with, uh, familiar with Zoom and, <laughs> and uh, nice to see you again. And thank you One all. One of these days I'll get back to Atlanta and, and, and we'll get together again. And, but it's been a tribute to Morris that you did all this, David. And there's a lot of work, a lot of work on the and those of us who knew Morris are grateful for your efforts. Thank you. The video will also be available on YouTube uh, for those who uh, use that platform. It is quite, quite remarkable that we can share uh, so much. Um, and again, I, I just want to thank everyone who um, participated, um, shared memories, uh, and most of all, David, uh, it was wonderful getting to know you this way. Yes, thank you very much um, to all of you who stuck it out to the end. And uh, particularly, I want to thank uh, Dale and Ashley and Kim for putting this together. It's been uh, just a wonderful thing uh, to be able to share these, uh, these insights and stories with all of you.